Hi, well, thanks very much for being here. Um, with 15 minutes, I don't have time to both discuss the nickel market and discuss our project. Um, and I find when I come to these conferences, I run into a lot of people that know a lot about gold or even about copper, but very few people that know much about nickel. So other than to say quickly that our project uh, is up in the same area of British Columbia as the last speaker, we're farther east and we're in the rolling foothills terrain rather than in the mountains. Um, and we're dealing with the same First Nations, the Taltan actually, who, who I agree are extremely business friendly. Um, and what we have is an extremely large deposit of low grade, open pitable sulfide nickel and cobalt. So that's as much as I'm gonna say about the project for now. The nickel market itself uh, is something that you should be paying attention to because it's going through a fundamental shift in supply and demand. Um, nickel has always traditionally traded with GDP uh, because it's part of the steel complex. It's, it's uh, a stainless steel is where 70% of nickel supply goes. So it would, you know, stainless steel goes with the GDP. There's a significant change happening right now that makes nickel a unique demand supply story that I would argue is gonna be getting explosive over the next couple of years. So again, just quickly, 5.2 billion pounds of nickel and 312 million pounds of cobalt in the measured plus indicated category alone. That is giant. Uh, and, and that resource is defined by 240 drill holes averaging 400 meters. A lot of work has gone into this. Okay, so. Oh, did you? Okay. <laughs> um, what's changed the nickel market is electric vehicles. And, 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 and the rise of electric vehicles means that there's going to be supply constraints on class one nickel, and I'll get into that more later. But I, you know, I would argue that electric vehicles have already reached the tipping point. And uh, this slide is from a presentation about tipping points. Uh, in the first uh, slide, this is Times Square in New York in 1900. And there's nothing but horses and buggies except for one automobile. The next slide is 13 years later in Times Square in New York, and it's all automobiles, and there's one horse and buggy hidden amongst them. So this concept of a new technology coming along and getting adopted and reaching a tipping point uh, is nothing new. Uh, in batteries, uh, nickel is what holds the electrons. Nickel has excellent electron density. And uh, so when you talk about batteries for electric vehicles, and you talk about, oh, maybe there's other battery types that will come along and replace lithium ion batteries. Well, the experts are telling me lithium ion is it for at least 20 years. And the serious money that's being spent on battery research by the big battery companies is all about trying to increase the amount of nickel in a lithium ion battery as a percentage. It's tricky. Um, you want to increase the amount of nickel in the battery so that your car will go farther on a single charge. The more electrons you pack into a space, the more volatile it is. And so cobalt is used to sort of calm that down. But everybody is moving towards 811, which is eight parts nickel, uh, one part cobalt, and one part manganese. Um, and so in a typical 300 kilogram battery pack, uh, uh, nickel would be about uh, 58 uh, kilograms out of the 300 kilograms. Nickel is, is the material that most people uh, in the electric vehicle manufacturing business and in the battery business are worried about going forward. They're not that worried about cobalt or lithium. Both of those things will get tight again, uh, but nickel is the main concern. And class one nickel, uh, which is 99.8% pure or better, uh, is in short supply and has been uh, not invested 
uh, you know, over the last 10 years, there's been very little investment in class one nickel. It's all been class two nickel. And so this shows you uh, uh, LME uh, warehouse stocks. This is all class one nickel, metal or briquettes. And we've gone from 450,000 tons of inventory at the LME four or five years ago um, in a market that today is about 2.3 million tons a year. So that's a huge overhang. And that's been drawn down steadily. Um, we have been uh, in a situation in this market where there is more class one being consumed than being produced for a number of years now. And we're just getting to a critical point. Uh, this is from Wood McKenzie. Uh, they figure that by 2025, we're going to need an incremental 300 to 400,000 tons per year of, of incremental class one nickel supply just for batteries. And they think that by 2040, you're going to need an incremental 2 million tons a year just for batteries alone. Um, and again, this is in a market that is currently 2.3 million tons a year. So just to get to where we need to be by 2025, that's like 10 enormous projects. So this, this uh, slide over here, uh, the inside of it uh, shows supply. This shows where the nickel comes from. And the outside of it shows usage. You can see that, that, that stainless steel is still 70% of the use. Class two nickel is ferro-nickel or nickel pig iron, which is a sort of low-grade ferro-nickel. Um, and it is, so it's nickel and iron together. And it's dug out from clays, they throw it in furnaces, and they put it straight into the uh, steel mills. Um, it's perfectly suitable for stainless steel. It's not suitable for any of the other class one uses uh, including batteries. And by the way, batteries are now 6% of the nickel market. Two years ago, they were 3%. We're not approaching a tipping point. We're past the tipping point. You get class from one nickel from two different sources. Sulfide deposits, which is what we have, or high-pressure, high-temperature acid leach deposits, which process limonite. And uh, limonite is basically a clay. So you're getting nickel and cobalt out of clay. You're putting it in autoclaves under conditions of high pressure and temperature, hitting it with a lot of sulfuric acid and managing to extract the nickel and the cobalt. It's tricky, it's expensive, um, and it's dirty, mostly. There's, there's, there's a lot of HPL projects that dump their highly acidic tailings in great quantities directly into the ocean. And one of the things that is becoming incredibly important just now, I, uh, you know, and this is feedback I'm getting from LME Week two, two weeks ago, is people are increasingly concerned with ethical supply of materials. And particularly in the electric vehicle business, this is being driven by consumers. In North America and Europe, if you're buying an electric vehicle, you're wealthy, you're educated, and you're environmentally responsible, and you're showing your view on the environment by the car that you drive. You don't want any supplies in that car that come from, you know, child labor. You don't want anything in your car that's coming from d dumping acid directly into the ocean. Um, so this whole concept of ethical supply is becoming increasingly important in the industry and it is being driven by consumers. So this is uh, an opportunity to talk about a bit of history. How much time do I have left? You've got seven minutes. Seven minutes, fantastic. This was put together for me by Lyle Tritton, who's an engineer I hired from Sherritt, uh, 25 years in the business, just a brilliant engineer. In his career, he's looked at and done due diligence into every single large undeveloped nickel deposit in the world. And he put this table <coughs> together for me. If you look at uh, the bottom line, it's capital intensity. This is how much capex you spend per ton of annual production. And you can see that HPAL, and this is HPAL to take to an intermediate product, so it's a valid comparison, is 75 to $90,000 per uh, annual ton of production in capex. We've expressed ours as a range because we're redoing our engineering. When we did our engineering report in December of 2011, 
uh, it was about $45,000 a ton. And then NPI, nickel pig iron, the range is ten to $20,000 a ton. Nickel pig iron came along and destroyed the nickel business because nobody can compete with that. That is cheap. Um, however, it's not at all suitable for any class one uses. So that's what's now saving the nickel industry again. Um, so our story is we caught the wave of the last super cycle in commodities and we raised enough money to drill all the holes, to drill off our deposit, do metallurgical and engineering work, culminating in uh, uh, an engineering report dated December of 2011 when nickel prices were at $11 a pound. Nickel prices then went down to $4 a pound. And I looked at that and, you know, our big low-grade deposit makes fantastic economic sense at a certain nickel price. We'll never be the low-cost producer, but we will be a very large producer. And um, so I put the project on mothballs waiting for the market to turn. Commodity markets always turn. I didn't foresee the arise of electric vehicles and the whole battery you know, revolution, but I just had faith that something would happen to turn the nickel market around, and something did happen. So uh, that's why, I mean, we stopped spending any money on this project. I stopped collecting a salary, and we just hung on to 100% of the asset, uh, and we hung on to our listing, and we're now getting active again. This is just about what I was just talking about. Uh, one aspect of this is that we have been funding research into CO2 sequestration into our tailings. If you take a silicate rock and expose it to the atmosphere, it will absorb CO2 and, and convert to a carbonate mineral rather than a silicate mineral. It's happening every day in nature all around us very slowly. Now you take those silicate rocks, grind them up to 80 microns, extract the sulfides as much as you can from them. Now you've got a silicate residue at 80 microns. You spread that around, it's absorbing CO2 very quickly. And we're working with a professor named Greg Dippel at the University of British Columbia, who's developed a methodology over the last 16 years to measure the CO2 uptake in the silicate residue. So we want to produce battery metals for a clean future and we're also going to be sequestering CO2 as we do it. There's a real possibility we could be a carbon neutral mine. So if you want a large, long-lived, ethical source of nickel and cobalt, you have to talk to us. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, this is from Wood McKenzie. It's a bit of a busy slide, but um, I'm mostly looking at... Two minutes left. Okay. I'm mostly looking at their incentive price to develop large new projects. They say that the incentive price, and it's mostly HPEL projects, because there's a lot of limonite in the world, is $12 a pound to incentivize building large new nickel projects on average. And their definition of incentive price is a 15% pre-tax internal rate of return. That's a very low bar, uh, but it's sort of an acceptable thing. That's, that's, that's what uh, Wood Mac explained to me for large, long-life projects. They'll take a lower IRR. Well, I looked at that and went, well, that's interesting, because usually my, uh, my, you know, my personal uh, definition of incentive price is a 20% after-tax internal rate of return. But I took our model, and let me caution you, this is December 2011, it's out of date, it's a valid model, but we have not built in cost inflation or anything like that. So this is just indicative. I want to give you sort of a, you know, a rough sense. I took our model and I calculated backwards. Pre-tax IRR of 15% uh, at, a at a Canadian dollar at 76 cents and a long-term cobalt price of $20 a pound, which I think is a reasonable long-term price for cobalt. And I get 6.85 a pound as the nickel price I need to compete with the HPAL people who, ha who, who need $12 a pound. Now with cost inflation, let's call that roughly $8 a pound. And then for fun, I ran it at $12 a pound, and I get a 29% after-tax internal rate of return and uh, you know, $2.8 billion 
of uh, depreciated net present value at a discount rate of 8%. So maybe that's a 24 or 23% um, uh, after-tax IRR. We're still very, very competitive with the HPL projects. And the last thought I want to leave you with is leverage. When you have a very large uh, uh, resource that is marginal in terms of it won't be the low-cost producer, it needs a certain price, it needs a lift in the price to make it economic, that's where you can make many, many multiples of your money if you're right about the underlying commodity. If you're wrong, it's risky. So if you like the nickel story and you want to be conservative, buy Norilsk, you'll do very well. If you want to be, uh, uh, take more risk for more upside, take a look at us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark.